If you have your Bible, let's go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I'm going to read one verse, verse 12. But that whole chapter and the chapter preceding that is where the story that I'm going to share with you today and draw some points. And I believe the Lord is going to build our faith today in this place. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12. O our God, will you not judge them? For we do not have power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. I want to speak today a message about marching into your miracle. What do you do when you don't know what to do? This is about a Jewish king this happened in Israel. This is not a fairy tale. It's a real story of happened to a king that Israel had. His name was Jehoshaphat. He was a mighty king. This was not a weak king. But when the problem came against him, a big problem of three nations coming together against him, he assembled together with God's people and he started to pray. And this prayer, this part of the prayer that I have used as a reference personally in my life anytime I am in the place where I just don't know what to do. I just don't know which way to take. And he prayed this prayer. He says, Lord, this multitude is too big for us. Our power is too small. And we don't know what to do. It's not that we're stupid. We're uneducated. We don't have military cabinet. We do. But the problem we're facing right now, we are ill-equipped to face. We don't know what to do. I want to share with you four things that you must do when you don't know what to do. Number one, when the enemy attacks, assemble with your family. Somebody say assemble. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 4 so Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. If you read the next verse it says then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly. Somebody say assembly. Assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. When Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites are coming against you. The first thing you must do is what Jehoshaphat did. Yes, he said, I don't know what to do. But he did something. He assembled. He didn't assemble with his military commandments, c commanders. He assembled with a family of Jewish people. Assemble. That means when you don't know what to do, go to church when you don't know what to do, go to your small group. When you don't know what to do, go to a prayer meeting. Jehoshaphat, twice we see, gathered together, assembled together. Earlier this year I preached a message, assemble required, where I presented a, uh, a chair disassembled in the box and I said this chair is useless if it's not assembled. You don't sit on the box, you sit on the chair. But that chair has to be put together. Each one of us are members of Jesus. But we're not the body individually. We are the body collectively. That's why as Christians we cannot go around and say things like, I know they're popular, especially during COVID days, like I am the church. The word church means ecclesia. It means an assembly. You are not the assembly. We are the assembly. You have to understand as a Christian, as strong as you are in Jesus, when hard times come against you, you are like a snowflake. Not a, yes, feeble, weak. But you know one thing about snowflakes, and I usually diss on snowflakes, but today I'm going to give them some credit. You put snowflakes together and they shut down schools. You put them weak, feeble, melt under the sun, little thingies together and they stop traffic. You put them together and they are forced to be reckoned with.
big strong people slide and fall why because when they come together that's why when you are alone by yourself fighting against Moabites maybe it's an addiction you're facing maybe you got some Edomites a physical illness attacking your body or perhaps you got some other Ammonites a financial issue that is attacking your life and you're like I don't know what to do do what Jehoshaphat did get together assemble get yourself another brother and another sister and you realize you're not the only one that's facing some Adamites and Ammonites and some other ites and when we group together the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name God begins to come in and no weapon formed against you can prosper greater is he that is in you than the one that's in the world when you don't know what to do assemble together when you see a predator attacking a prey and you've seen probably enough of movies and videos online they usually seek to isolate the prey from the herd your first instinct when you face a problem bigger than you is to hide instead of assemble the enemy will whisper to you and say nobody understands what you're going through you know Pastor Vlad just had a baby and you're going through this everybody's rejoicing nobody cares about your weeping situation but my, my friend our life is more than our Instagram posts we all have battles we're fighting and that's why when you join a small group you realize our life is not just victories sometimes it has challenges and there is strength in unity 148 studies involving 308,849 participants between 1980 and 2014. Investigators concluded that social isolation was roughly equivalent to the negative effects of smoking one pack of cigarettes per day. Online today caused us to have thousands of friends virtually and zero friends personally since the rise of internet and social media most of us have more followers but less friends most of us talk to people in other nations and no longer talk to our own family and that has given the rise of a smaller church attendance is while we became isolated we also became an easy prey for Ammonites, Philistines, I mean drugs, alcohol, depression, anxiety, the spike. You see a generation that's more connected to everyone online and this is the generation that is, has least mental good health. Why? Because isolation, according to these studies, is equivalent to smoking on your health. Another study that was done, Claire Young from the National Academy of Sciences examined social relationships and psychological markers across two decades of more than 14,000 participants. Her findings were that socially isolated individuals have increased blood pressure, body mass index, heart disease, cancer, waist circumference, and inflammation when compared to individuals who were socially connected. So we're not only talking about our emotional state. Even on your physical state, these researchers found, you know, all they found is what God said in the first book of the Bible. It is not good for men to be alone. When you're under an assault, you will be tempted to run. You will be tempted to say, I can't join a small group this week. Why? I just fell into this sin. I feel guilty. I'm just going to bench watch and watch just, just Netflix. But that is the enemy wanting to isolate you. Because he knows if you come to that group against your desires and guilt and shame, you come out different. Somebody will have a prophetic word. Somebody will pray for you. Somebody will encourage you. Somebody just being there sometimes. Same thing happens on Sunday morning. The enemy will say, well, you've done bad. Look, you're not feeling good. You're under attack. Your family is not doing good. Your health is not doing good. Just stay home. But Jehoshaphat, when he didn't know what to do, he assembled together 
Come on, somebody. We got to assemble together. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want you to write down the second thing that we must do when we don't know what to do. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. The Bible says Jehoshaphat gathers together with his people. Again, let me remind you, this was not a military strategic meeting. This was a prayer meeting. Because the scripture tells us Jehoshaphat he was not an intercessor, he was a king. Jehoshaphat did not have the keys to church to open the church at five o'clock like Jose is and open the church and pray. Jehoshaphat was a military commander but he gathers people together and he says, I don't know what to do but I know how to pray. I don't know if I should move to that city or not but I know how to get on my knees and ask God for help. I don't know if I should marry this person or walk away from this relationship, but I know how to pray. I don't know if I should take this offer or not, but I know how to pray. I don't know what to do with this sickness that is advancing in my body, but I also know how to pray. You might not know what to do, but if you know how to pray, God will find the way. How do you pray? It's not that hard. Four things Jehoshaphat did in his prayer. He praised God for His power. He praised God for His gifts. He complained about His invaders and He asked for help. When you don't know what to do, learn the power of short prayers. Some people think their prayers have to be sophisticated. If you can be sophisticated with God, God can understand PhD students as well. If you can be Shakespeare's with God, knock yourself out. But if you're one of those people, you're like, I don't know how to put those two words together. You praise God for His power. That means prayer focuses my attention from my problem to His power. Even though I am down, God is still on His throne. And Jehoshaphat didn't know what to do. He said, God, you're still a great God. You're a powerful God. I'm down, you're up. That's why I'm calling you. <laughs> I'm not calling them gods that are deaf, mute and dumb and that we make in our own image. I'm calling the God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Take a moment and acknowledge God's power. And then he acknowledged God's gifts. He says, God, you gave us this land. It was a gift from you. Take a moment and acknowledge what you have instead of what you don't have. Take a moment and acknowledge a little bit of health that you have instead of just start praying for the ones that you don't have. We must remain grateful and we can't be grateful if we don't thank God for what we have. And then he complains. Complaining is good in prayer after you worship. It's bad when you start with complaining. But if you start with worship, you start with praise and then you end up a little bit complaining and he said, he was honest. He said, Lord, that's not fair. These nations came, attack us. We didn't mean them harm. We didn't do anything wrong. Lord, that's not right. They're paying us for something we didn't do. God, that is not fair. He's not blaming God. He's blaming them. Sometimes it's okay to get a little bit emotional. Turn on a little drama in prayer. Sometimes it's okay to let the tears roll and say, God, that's just not fair. I'm hurt. This is not right. Why is this happening to me? Read book of Job. God is not intimidated with your grieving. God included one book in the Bible called Lamentation. Meaning it's okay to lament. But when you only lament but you don't praise God for who He is, you might find yourself in bitterness. But if you start with some praise and say, God, I'm down, you are up. God, things look bad, but there's still a few things that are good in my life. And I thank you for the few good things in my life. And God, my life just sucks. Man, it's been hard. It's been always like this. I don't know what's happening to me. Why is this happening to me again and again and again? What am I going to do? I don't know. And then you got to finish on this. Can you help me? Don't finish with whining. You don't want the situation to be like that. 
we need help. Prayer is not to tell God we have a problem. God knows that. Prayer is to invite God into our problem so that His power can show up and He can change things around. And Jehoshaphat says, you are great. I thank you for the land you've given us. That's not fear how these people are treating us. And God, could you help us? We look to you. Successful prayer changes your focus before it changes your circumstances. How do you know if you pray successfully? If you walk out and your focus is different. Not your situation is different yet. Jehoshaphat said this, you're great. You've given us this land. God help us. And then he says this, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I started this prayer having my eyes on these Edomites, on these Ammonites, on these other ites. I started with them. But when I got into prayer, I started to focus on God. I focused on my situation. I asked Him for help and I'm walking out of prayer saying, Lord, I just want to let you know my eyes are now on you. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go, but I know where to look and I'm looking to you. And prayer started rough. It was turbulent. It was like a roller coaster. My emotions were all over the place, but God's peace came in and He stabilized me. Before my circumstances changed, my heart became stable. That's why the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So God says, I want you to also be thankful. Let your requests be known to God. And then it says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Before God releases His power, He releases His peace. And you walk out of that prayer, your life is the same. Your heart is not. It used to be troubled and now you know the King of the universe has heard your case and He's working on it. There is this assurance, this peace that comes. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know who and I'm looking to Him. I don't know how God will save my kids. I don't know how God will change my spouse. I don't know how God will provide for me but I know a God who can and I look to Him and He will. That's the successful prayer. Successful prayer is not when you come out and you get a text message right away that your problem got resolved. It's when you get something in your heart that shifted and you walk out and usually within 24 hours to 72 hours you notice a change in the circumstances as well. Number three, God gives His promise before he brings his provision. Jehoshaphat prayed and the Bible says this, then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jalil, the son of Matthias. Man, how many like generations does this go to? And a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. I want you to notice this, God's answer comes by a word before it comes by God's works. What many people miss about God is they think if I ask God for help, He right away comes and changes my circumstances. It's not always how God works. Sometimes when you ask God for help, He comes and gives you a word. That's God already moving in your life. But because we're such a big addicts for, no, everything needs to change around me. But see, God's Word is like a check that God gives you. Now, if I come and I give you a check, do you thank me when you cash the check or when you get the check? Now, if you know that I have the money in my bank account and I don't make fraudulent checks, and I give you a check and say, I just want to bless you. Now, I didn't give you the money, I gave you a check. You don't wait to cash the check to thank me. You take the check, put a smile on it and say, how, why, why would you want to do that? How, did I deserve that? Thank you so much. Before you even cash the check, why? Because that check is already me blessing you. See, when God gives you a promise, when He gives you a word, when He quickens a word, it is God giving a check. It is God already working on your behalf. 
the sickness is still in the body the financial problem is still there the family crisis is still there but God's word gets quickened that prophetic word gets quickened and it's as sure as done we had a situation one time when me and my wife decided to bless this couple from our church with the car they just had a car accident and they lost their car and we had this nice car uh, Toyota Camry it was like the first car that I bought out of a dealer because you know for Slavics we, we buy used cars um, and so we used not just used cars but junkyard cars fix them and then uh, sell them and so this particular car I bought them out of the out of the dealership brand new car I've already used it for like five years nice car I took pride in this car and on Saturday it was the day before Sunday the Lord put on our, both of our hearts to bless this couple in our church with this car but you know I drove uh, like a Jehu in the Bible so uh, my tires, tires wore, out, wore out and then my bumper had a lot of uh, bugs so we meet with this couple on Sunday after church and we say hey I just wanted to uh, bless you guys with the car so they broke down they start crying they said really we only had one car so they're like so which car we're like well the one that we have they're like well that's your only car and that's a nice one I'm like yeah I know and they just said thank you so much I said but I can't give you the car yet because I want to change my tires change the oil and change the bumper They're like oh pastor take all the time that you need you can change the engine too <laughs> while you're at it <laughs> they left the house with the car and without a car they left the house stopped shopping for a car they called their family members and they said we got a car and the family member says uh, where well <laughs> It's kind of complicated but um, we got it so where is it at it's it's not like here yet but it's like right here do you see what I'm saying now I could have lied I could have changed my mind but see they trusted their friend that they knew that this promise wasn't me throwing words to make them excited this was God, me working already to word their good not by giving the car but by giving a promise and then I went working on the car that they're supposed to get see when God gives you a promise sometimes then he goes behind the scenes and starts working on the miracle behind the scenes or he works on you behind the scenes but God's promise God's Word, the Bible says, does not return void to God. God's Word is like a sword. God's Word is like oil. God's Word is like a hammer. God's Word is like rain. God's Word is like seed. It does have power, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the divisions of soul and spirit, bone and marrow. My friend, God with His Word said, let there be light and light was there. What we usually think is that God works with His hands first. But God works first with His Word. God said, let there be light. Four days later came the sun. The world I live in, you cannot get the light without the sun. God is opposite. First is the light, then the sun. The world I live, you don't become a father until you have children. God makes Abraham a father and then He gives him children. The world I live in, you don't become righteous until you do right things. God's world is He makes you righteous so you can do right things. I want to tell you something, God does it, does it the opposite. He starts with His Word. He creates something here. That's why the Bible says the faith is the assurance of things hopeful. Faith, if, if faith is the substance of things hoped for and the assurance of things unseen. God releases His Word and Jehoshaphat is there praying to God, seeking God and God came through a prophet and says, Jehoshaphat, don't be afraid. Tomorrow go out stand and you will see the salvation Jehoshaphat said yeah God is moving everything's gonna be okay we're gonna win why because prayer is the response to a problem praise is the response to a promise this couple that I gave this promise to they didn't thank me when they got the keys they thanked me when they got the promise and they left rejoicing no they didn't have a car their life was still the same but everything changed. Why? Because a the person they trust gave them a word. A month and a half later on Friday night prayer, I handed the keys and now they received that which they received a month and a half before. See when God sends His word, He's not bluffing. He's not exaggerating. He's not throwing words on the wind. When He says, I'm with you, I'll never leave you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. 
when he says I'm the Lord who heals you when he says by my stripes you were healed I bore your transgressions I bore your iniquities when he says you are a new creation and all things have passed away he did include your old things as well when the Lord says that you can do all things through him who strengthens you greater is he that is in you than the one that's in the world God was not exaggerating he wasn't filling up the book with empty words his words have power all of his words are God breathed you can bank on it we pray and God answers but he doesn't answer first with a miracle he answers first with a message he doesn't answer first with the power demonstration with the promise he gives you a promise when I was a kid just a teenager at 16 God gave me a promise, a vision at 16 on the parking lot of Winkle that one day our church will be a church that will impact nations. He didn't bring that. He just brought the promise and I believed it. I don't know if I didn't have experience but I believed it and I started to learn to believe. I didn't see the promise for a long time but that's not what matters. What matters is God is faithful and during the process he develops the person he gives the promise to some God is working on someone sometimes it's on your miracle or sometimes it's on you he's working when he gives you the promise between the fulfillment the provision and the promise is a process of God developing you and that's exactly what happened to Jehoshaphat God gave a promise and said I got you you're not gonna die you're not gonna get destroyed by these enemies I know you're smaller than you think I am with you and you don't have to fight this battle. <sighs> Last thing, you have to show up. You don't have to fight but you have to show up. Miracles are God's job. Marching is ours. Second Chronicles chapter 20, 16 and 17. I'm gonna read not the full verses. I'm just gonna skip a few parts of it. Um, tomorrow, somebody say tomorrow. So today we pray, tomorrow we slay. Today we meet, tomorrow we march. It's important that today's faith has tomorrow's steps. Because if all we do is simply pray, but we don't slay, meaning we don't do something out of our faith, we might find ourselves in the place of expecting a miracle. Because miracle doesn't show up where you pray. It shows up when you act with God. It shows up because you pray, because God is good, but doesn't always show up in the prayer meeting. It shows up in the marketplace. It shows up in the meeting. It shows up in the march. The Bible says this, tomorrow go down against them. You, do, you will not need to fight in this battle. Lord, since I'm not going to fight, can I not go? Can you just go by yourself? I'm kind of scared of those people. Plus like just in case you don't show up and they attack me like it's going to be safer for me not to go. Just for my personal safety Lord. Can I just not go tomorrow? But I want you to notice what God says. Tomorrow go down against them. You will not need to fight this battle. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. I don't get it God. So I don't need to fight but I need to show up. I don't need to fight but I can't stay in the prayer meeting. I have to step out and take some steps of faith. What would you do if you know God is with you? Do those things. When you don't know what to do, you pray about it. You get in God's Word and guess what you do next? You have to do what you would do if you knew God is with you. Why? Because He's with you. But you won't see His miracles if you only stay in the place where you prayed. You have to apply for that job. You have to go to that meeting. Sometimes you have to take those steps. You have to take those steps. You can't just stay in that place and say, I'm just gonna pray and God will fight. God says, I will fight but you have to walk. But Lord, it's kind of scary. God says, I got you. I am with you and you are going to win. Keep on walking with me. Jesus tells the lepers, He says, go and show yourself to the priest. Uh, why would we want to do that? The people who show up to the priests are people with the testimony. We are sick and the Bible says as they went they got healed. 
The scripture says about Abraham that the Lord says, move out of the earth of Chaldeans and go to a land I will show you. And in Hebrews 11 it says this, and Abraham obeyed God by faith, went not knowing where he was going. How's that for a five-year plan? <laughs> what is your five-year plan? God told me to go where? He didn't like specify. So where are you gonna go? I don't know, but I'm gonna go. <laughs> and if I take the wrong turn, He'll show if I'm wrong. And the scripture says, now I'm not saying every step of your life has to be like that. If that's like that, you need a little bit of wisdom. Because Christianity is not just faith, it's faith and wisdom. Wisdom says, have a plan, go to school, figure this out, have a budget, and that's important. The Bible is the book of wisdom, but our God is also the God of faith. Meaning there are seasons and there are situations and there are things you have no experience for. You've never done this before. Like Joshua told the people of Israel, the path we're about to walk on, none of us ever walked in before. We're gonna have to walk by faith. Why? Because we don't have experience in that. Tomorrow, march against them. And God says, I am with you. I will show up, but you have to go. The servants come to Jesus and Jesus tells them, I want you to take water and fill it with these vessels and then take this water to the person that is in charge of the wedding, wedding, wedding um, uh, banquet and tell them it's wine. If I would be a servant, I said, Jesus, could you do that? <laughs> I don't want to get fired. My family depends on me. I don't want to go tell, say, hey, sir, this is wine when I know it's water. How is that going to turn into wine from water? Jesus didn't tell them the details. He just told them to obey. And the scripture says, as they put water into those vessels and they brought that water to the main person in charge of the wedding banquet, he says, man, this is such a good wine. Where did that miracle happen? Let's see, that's not our job. Our job is not to do the miracle. Our job is to obey. Your job is not to change your spouse. Your job is to honor your spouse or love your spouse. Your job isn't to change your children. It is to raise your children. Your job is not to bring about healing. Your job is to believe for healing. It is God's job to bring that healing to pass. Your job is not to deliver yourself because you can't do that. There's only Christ who sets the captives free. Your job is to come to Christ and He says, I will set you free. Miracle is God's job. Marching is mine. So many of us miss the miracle because we are trying to take on God's job. You cannot produce a miracle. You can't heal a fly and you can't save yourself. That is God's job. Let God be God and you be you. You obey and trust and God will do the rest. Build an ark and the rain will come. Fill oil with those empty vessels and God will do the miracle. I love this story because the Bible says in verse 22 of chapter 20, when they began to shout and praise, the Lord suddenly attacked the Ammonites, Moabites, and the men of Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. Now interesting part is the word suddenly attacked in Hebrew is set ambushers against them. Some people say that actually God released His angels to attack those enemies. So as they were walking, the people of God, obeying God, not knowing what's going to happen, not being fully sure except God's promise, the scripture says they were not walking to their funeral, they were walking to their feast. They were walking to their breakthrough and God releases some kind of a spiritual force, confuses these enemies, they attack each other and now they came to a place of victory and breakthrough. I want you to notice this. Now on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Berahach, for they, there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Berahach until this day. So the valley that this was happening became the Valley of Blessing. That word that I probably mispronounced is called the blessing. I love that because when you march with God by faith, even the valleys hold victories. Even the places others say, this is a valley, you say yes, but with God, it can be a place of victory. This sickness kills people, but with my God, I can experience healing and my valley can become a place of my testimony. They could say that, but this, this struggle 
never ends but for you this struggle can become a place of spoil a victory and a blessing people said in Washington churches don't grow it's a graveyard but with God a valley can have a victory a public school kids don't want to hear anything about God these Gen Z's don't want to hear of anything about God but if we trust God is the God of miracles and we're gonna walk in our obedience we will see our valleys become places of blessing you may come from a family where nobody amounted to anything and they struggled and they told you that listen our family we don't go to school our family we don't break through financially we're just honestly always struggling divorced sick struggling listen and you walk with God I want to tell you something you belong to the family of Abraham I want to remind you today we break that poverty mentality we break that sickness mentality it's okay if you are sick but don't be sick in your mind have in your mind the promise of God don't always live with this expectation I'm going to die the devil will show up the worst thing that will happen to me see faith is expecting God will show up tomorrow fear is expecting the devil will show up tomorrow faith is expecting listen I know that my parents are responsible for my history but my faith is responsible for my destiny I know I had things traveling in the bloodline but listen it's like a loaded gun the genes load the gun my choices, my faith pulls the trigger. I refuse to pull the trigger on sickness. I refuse to pull the trigger on poverty. I refuse to pull the trigger on trauma. I refuse to pull the trigger on that. Why? Because in Christ I'm a new creation and this valley can become a place of victory for me. I can see a change in my family tree. Not because I'm some great but because someone is great with me. This valley was supposed to be a place of their defeat but the Bible says they walked in and they saw the victory in the valley and they were gathering spoil for days for the glory of God. Your current problem can become a testimony and you can testify to the glory of God. What are you expecting? You know faith and fear have same, something, same thing in common. They both ask you to believe in something you cannot see choose to believe in God. Think of your car. You have the drive and you have the you have the R and you have the D. It doesn't take a lot to turn to R or to D but the directions change. One click to R and you're going backwards. One click to D and you're going forward. It takes same faith to believe for your miracle as it is to believe for your failure. It takes same expectation to believe in God to show up as it is to take faith to believe the devil will show up and ruin your life. Don't expect the devil. Expect God. I'm not saying devil won't show up. He will but that will be his defeat. God wants to show up in your future. So when I'm marching in obedience, I'm not marching to my funeral per se. I'm marching to God's victory. I'm expecting God to show up. What if God doesn't show up? Well, He promised to be with me. So if I walk with God to a fire, this fire won't kill me. David says, I walk with God through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then it says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What does this mean? I choose to live by faith. I choose to walk by faith. I choose to take a step of faith. Why? Because as long as there is breath in my nostrils, there is hope in me. This disease doesn't have to be the end of me. This situation doesn't have to define me. This problem doesn't have to stock, keep me stuck. Why? Because I believe in God. I believe in the miracle. There was this lady, I shared this story in my book, uh, Break Free, where she had a phobia of thieves in her house. She gets married to her husband and on the wedding night she wakes up and wakes up her husband and says, somebody's in the house. We have a thief in the house. Can you go check? And so he goes in, of course, and faithful, wonderful, loyal, sacrificial husband checks and comes back, comforts his wife and says, honey, everything's okay. There is no thief in the house. So she kept doing this every single night to the point where it became automatic for him to blindly walk around the house, just come back and do his tour of the house and comfort his wife. Nobody's here. After 30 years, he was doing his routine check and lo and behold, there was a thief. He kind of got excited. <laughs> Finally, you're here. The guy points a gun at him and says, you know, give me all of your belongings. So 
he gives him all the belongings and right before the thief leaves he he tells the thief he says you gotta meet my wife <laughs> she's been expecting you for 30 years you finally came <laughs> let me ask you a question what are you expecting Jesus said to a blind man according to your faith let it be to you every day you wake up you can turn your faith into reverse or drive you can turn your faith the devil will show up the worst thing will happen to me I'm expecting the worst today or you can turn your faith into drive and say greater is he who is in me I know the enemy are greater greater than me I don't know what to do but I know who is with me and I'm taking step every day as though God is with me you know why because he is with me people will say well this valley nothing ever grows you're listening you're in tri-cities get out of this place you know you really want to be successful go to some kind of a bigger city nothing wrong with that but see God can give you a breakthrough in the valley some of you are actually in the lower valley in Sunnyside or Prosser and maybe you're thinking man I need to get out of here and go somewhere else where the green pastures are your God grows lilies in the valleys your God can give you water in the valleys. He can give you breakthrough in the valleys. If He doesn't move you, listen, trust in Him to move in the valley. So many friends of mine were like, well, so when are you planning to get out of that old Tri-Cities? I was like, why? My God can move in Tri-Cities and He can turn Tri-Cities into a beautiful place of revival as He is doing. Why? I don't need another place to see the move of God. I need faith to see the move of God. And it can happen in Tri-Cities. It can happen in my job. It can happen in my marriage. It can happen with my children. It can happen in my health. I choose to trust in God. I want to challenge you today to trust in God. If you gave up on that and you're just cruising through life and every day you maybe you're like, I'm not driving in reverse. My life is neutral. I just wake up and kind of whatever happens. Come on, snap out of that. You're a believer. You're not a feeler. You belong to a house of faith. You have the word of faith, the spirit of faith, the gift of faith to live a life of faith. Live a life with your head up, your square shoulders. Why? Not because Donald Trump is coming back. Jesus is moving with you not because you're you just hopeful that everything is going to be better in this world no because you have faith that Jesus Christ is with you lo I am with you to the end of age and God can do the miracle you believe God can change your financial situation God can change your health